everyone, and welcome to another edition of Diversity. My name is Rhea. I am your host, and I'd love to welcome back my co-host, Dr. Joseph Nwaye. How are you? Thank you. I'm doing well. How about you? Good, thanks. And today, we have the pleasure of having a guest by the name of Maurice Edwards. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your history, and what diversity means to you? Okay. Yes, my name is Maurice Edwards. I'm the president of the D.C. Metropolitan Organization of Black Scientists. I've been a member of this organization for since about 1984. This organization is 51 years old. I was raised in Washington, D.C. I graduated from the D.C. public school system. When I graduated, I went to North Carolina A&T State University, which is an HBCU, the number one in the country. And I obtained my master's in professional biology. Once I left North Carolina a and I attended Bowie State University, where I obtained my master's in administrative management, public policy. My background is in laboratory science and also grant management. Once I graduated from North Carolina a and I worked in laboratory for 20, 25 years in the field of biology, medical laboratory, radiochemistry, and, and research. And once I finished that, those areas, I then transitioned to grants management. So for the last 16, 17 years, I've been working on grant management, working on grants for universities and private entities. Wow, I, I feel a little less than here because I'm surrounded by men that have the most amazing education and I don't have anything near that. That's quite the accomplishment. Tell us a little bit about the organization Black Scientists. Why? Is that necessary? Give your example. A lot, like a lot of the uh, fraternities, the black fraternities were back in the, in the 1911 and 1930s and 40s. A lot of times when, when blacks went to different organizations of work or school, they suffered from isolation. And then a lot of times they could not get promotion due to things not being told to them. So as different professionals progress, they obtain different positions, they told other people how to come in, how to get those positions, what class to take, where to go, what degrees to obtain, look for their job announcements, and then fill out the job announcements that they fill out the background. It's through that process, a lot of them, the black scientists were able to progress through their ranks. Now, this organization was started back, like I said, back in 70, they, they organized in 72, but incorporated in 73. Back in the 70s, they had about at least about four or five chapters. And the chapters got together, and what they did was they had conventions. They talked about different things that were going on in the industries, and then they they came back and then they put plans together so that each person that went through certain fields they can get the education, the experience, and then the promotion. I know a lot of the um, the guys that came through in the D.C. area they were working at NIH, Wall Street to the research, and USDA, and, and back in those days. It was very hard to get promotion. Like I said, by them communicating, writing information down, passing it on and bringing people up, that's how um, a lot of them were able to get promoted. We have guys that who were chemists with USDA and there was an exchange program. One guy, he went over to Japan for two years and they did a job. He's like, you're a chemist? They were made by him. You know? And he did very well with them. We had a, a couple other people that worked with National Science Foundation. We had one guy in the organization. He was an oceanographer. A lot of kids don't, and they say, say you couldn't be an oceanographer. He was an oceanographer. We have a, a variety of fields. And the good thing about that is a lot of those people were hitting figures. They just didn't know they were. And then, like now, a lot of the black scientists are now coming to the forefront for things that they did that people didn't never know about. I would give you a prime example. I went to Theodore Roosevelt High School in D.C. There's a lady named Dr. Shirley Ann Jackson. You know what she invented? Take a guess. Every time your phone rang, what pops up? Call ID. She invented that. She has a litany of inventions, probably like 15 or 20 that we don't know about. So things like that the kids don't know about, we need to tell them about. Because they have a chance to do things that they thought they couldn't do. With my group, sometimes we would do, we'd go around to different schools, have science festivals, science fairs, bring these people out, let them talk to the kids 
so the kids can know that they can do this. All they have to do is put forth an effort. If they need help, we can give them help. They need resources, we can find them resources. The way things are going on out in, you know, in, the, in the world and in, in this area, kids need, need all the resources they can get. They need people they can trust. And when they see things like scientists who are black, they're like, wow, this is amazing. And the good thing is, you can use different things to relate to them. Prime example, I'm in the Pigskin Club, which I think all the athletes in the D.C. area. So I told them, I said, we can teach kids through sports about sight. Man, prime example, you go down and out. We do it down and in or a post pattern. That's an 80 degree triangle. Right? When you throw the ball, the velocity, the time and speed, that's physics. You can mix that together. Kids, they can put that together. They can feel pop in their head. But if you say they use the plain, grand method, they like, this is boring. So there's a lot of ways you can teach kids, but you just got to find that method to, them, to get to them. And, and then you got to gain that trust. So that's what I mainly is trying to do right now. Is I'm trying to promote things, avionics, even esports. Esports is very important to kids now. Because that's science. And then I didn't know that they're giving scholarships for esports now. Paying on the simulators, you can get a scholarship to go to school. So that's amazing. That's what my group mainly is trying to do. We're trying to promote the STEM in the D.C. public school system and the surrounding school, try to bring people out who have done things in the past and show the kids that things can be coached. All they have to do is just, you know, put their mind to it, study, and then trust people. If they trust certain people, they can get to where they want to go. What percentage do you think in the U.S. of scientists overall are black? Very little. Probably, I can't say per se, but I would say probably about two to five percent. It's improving than it was back in the 60s and 70s, but it's still very low. And the thing is, what I've learned through listening to peer review meetings is that a lot of times when scientists go into the field, a lot of times they're chastised if they're home and they're giving a hard way to go. But they, they're not making no money. The field is not paying any money. So a lot of times what happens is they'll leave the research field and go to private industry where they make more money. Because most kids when they come out of school, they want, I was listening on the news the other day, the average kid come out of college expect to make $80,000 a year. You go to a science field, that's not. <laughs> now as you go to a specific field, that's as hot as a hot button item at that point in time when you graduate, engineering, computer science, artificial intelligence. Even now, my stuff like cartoons, designing cartoons and commercials, that's the hot topic item right there. But science is sometimes pushed back on the, on the forefront as far as uh, something to major in. It's a hard subject, but you don't get paid for it that much. Wow. What do you think, Dr. Joseph, what do you think would be, and how can people like us or people like the audience what can we do to create change? You are just beginning. I think there are a lot of resources. There are a lot of intelligent people. There are a lot of people who've worked hard, who can give so much. But unfortunately, racism is still pervasive, regardless of what people say. If you look at what Morris had said now, I would have liked to start asking him, why did they form these scientists? Perhaps that will give us the window through which we can see remarkable people who could contribute immensely to the well-being and development of the United States, in fact, the world. Unfortunately, the evil of racism, discriminatory practices, subjugate those individuals who could contribute so much. And as a result, they don't even have faith in the system. I had Maurice mention trust quite a number of times. And I think it's, the, it's, the, it's paramount that People work with those they can trust. Really, I told you last time, 
when I was told to go to Prince George's County, it's not far from here. Dr. Parham asked me to do, go to the school and help to train the people that were characterized as at-risk kids. These are kids whose fault is the system that systematically developed a mechanism to subjugate them. And these kids are very smart than, that they are never credited for it. So they understand the dynamics. So they may just come to the class and make noise. And that's their little way of retaliating. <laughs> you think that they don't know anything. But the fact is that they do. Now, I told you about the soccer we played with those people. As a result, they began to warm up to us. And then we come, came with a new policy. If you want to play soccer with us, you got to do your homework. The students who were considered as at-risk kids, the rate at which they accelerated in the academic performance, it was uh, incredible. Even those who had thought they would never know anything came back and told us that those students are really very good. Go. Isn't it a case, too, that if a child is told over and over again and society is telling them, their family is telling them, their circumstances are telling them that they're worthless, that's all they expect to be? If we, as a society, were to look at these children and say, you're worth something. Every single one of you is worth something. You can contribute. You can change society. You can change the world. You have the capability. You are worth something. You were born because there's a reason for you to be on this planet. Do you think that we would see perhaps even a better future for the entire planet? And this is how we treated all children. Yes, because what I've observed without I had substitute teaching company that children want to be loved and they want trust and they want stability. Now, if you can give that to those kids, the kids will show that back to you. They will relax their attitude towards adults. But if they don't get that and they think that all they're trying to do is chest tie them and bring them down, they will never try to advance and, and learn things in life. From my experience, you have to bring them into your fold, you have to trust them learn, and give them to trust you and then to show them ways that they can improve themselves. That's so correct. John Ogu, a prominent scholar who was at the University of California, Berkeley, he passed away. He came with the term voluntary immigrants and involuntary immigrants. And what had been true, including in my own research, is that kids who had been told they're not going to want anything. Kids, it doesn't matter whether they're black or white or green or whatever it is. When you say it enough, they begin to believe it. And they begin to live up to that expectation. There's something we call self-fulfilling prophecy. That's what had been professed by their parents, by their teacher, by the company they kept, it comes to a point where they own it, and that's how they will behave. Now, you can see kids reflecting that in classes. Say, for instance, this is well documented. Black people, black kids, whom when they go to school, they'll be making noise in foundation to the class wall. Then anyone that goes into doing the classwork, they say to the person, hey, you're acting white. You're acting white. You know what it means? Learning is for white people. Actually, they are trying to retaliate. You say, I can't do anything. And then yet yeah, you want me to do something. No, I'm not going to do that. That's the world we live in. Those kids, some people think that they don't know something. They are pretty smart, except that they are using it in the wrong way. Because ultimately, whatever they achieve is what going to push the trajectory of their lives for success. And when they don't, like their own. 
is it not a complete just you know i know for me when i was growing up obviously i'm white i would cause problems in class now i wasn't labeled a dummy i was labeled as someone who was disruptive and maybe i was just bored but in a world where just being born anything other than white means that you're less than that sets you up for failure to begin with. And that is something that has been happening for generation upon generation. And if we think that these children that are being born today, unless there is positive role models out there, unless there is people that are making that change, are speaking out and doing everything they can and saying, you know what, it doesn't matter what color you are, you're smart, you're worth it, you deserve it, and you should be given a chance. And how can we make that happen? How can we change? centuries of bullshit, for lack of a better word, of how we're teaching people and how we're creating a society that is intolerant. That's very interesting, Ria. There's um, a theory we call cognitive science theory. And they are of the view that active learning enables you to develop what they characterize as deep learning. And the people in behaviorism will argue that you reward people for whatever they do and punish them for whatever they don't do. That's true. But I don't really care about behaviorism because I think it's reward is not intrinsic. The learning that sustains are the type of learning that is intrinsic. It's you moving it forward. It's not the one you, you do because you are giving lollipop. And that's why our program at SDIG, we have a, um, a tutorial services. We believe in what we characterized as consumer orientation model. And that means when you have a learner, you don't just go and start teaching, which is common in schools. The first thing you do is to assess the students. The purpose of the assessment is not to substantiate the garbage. Some people may have been thinking about certain students, but to authentically ascertain what the learner knows. And when you know, what the learner knows, then you start building upon it. And the people that had gone through that are people that they may have been saying they cannot do this, they cannot do that. If it's argument, we utilize the argument that looks into various ways. You can look at argument in many ways, but some people really know how to follow argument. So the issue of equity and social justice is critical to developing trust. Just as Maurice said that their group, you work so hard, you don't get promotion that is so deserving. How can an individual be going through that, watch people whom he or she knows that he does better than getting promotion solely because of the connection and the garbage they have of uh, certain people, regardless of their performance, their performance is nothing. They are kept down. Hannah Jones, a prominent Amer African-American scholar who graduated from one of the good schools in North Carolina, worked for New York Times. She was the one that wrote the 90, I can't remember the, the time, but the point I'm trying to make is that when she went back to school after doing all this monumental work, they expected her to wait. She was not given tenor, which was given to everybody that came to that position, but nobody did one quarter of what she did. That's why she left that school. She's now at Howard University 
do you have amazing job? That's racism, pure racism. The difference between her and all the white people that we are through is that she happened to have a, a black pigmentation of skin. That's it. That's nothing else. It's papalexin. That's the life we live. Which needs to change. But I, we've been talking about that. And I think this is what really gets me deep down is that it's been an issue for centuries. We've been talking about it for centuries. We talk ourselves until, and it, for me, maybe I've been talking about it for 20 years, but there are so many people that have been talking about it for so many years prior to me even being in existence. And to see where we are today with the hatred, because it's pure hatred, it's nothing else. It's fear and hatred that create racism. It's like I said the other day, if we were all blind, how much better could we see? The world would be a better place. <laughs> we need to lose that fear. We need to lose that hatred. Morris, what can we do as a society? What can the listeners of this podcast or the viewers of this podcast, what can they do to help you? Maurice Edwards, as president of Black Scientists, spread your message and help get these kids into changing the world of the future, whether it be scientifically or just purely by getting the best damn education that they deserve. Basically, we need to get more, people that have more mentor programs, the mentor kids. A lot of people don't want to deal with, they don't want, they want hands on. They'll talk to them on Zoom, they'll email them, but as far as one-on-one, they don't want to deal with them. And only when you deal with the kids one-on-one, you get to learn them and be able to help them. Because a lot of times it's not the kids, it's the family. I was in a mentor program with my fraternity and we had a, like an eight week training program. And one thing we learned in the program is, is a lot of times the kids have problems. If the kids and family can be helped, the probably the problems can be solved. And I think that's just basically true because what I was there, when my mentee, when I was mentoring him, is he had a lot of problems at home. And so, Sometimes, a lot of times, that's generational. So if you come from a poor background, and their parents and their parents, all they know is being in that situation, it's hard to convince a kid that they're going to be successful in life. All they see is that they buy. That's what they buy. That's all they see. It's, I feel like my son. That's true. It's hard to convince a kid that even if you look at basketball players, Kids are looking at them, they say, oh, this person makes millions of dollars. You're talking about education. The mind yeah. goes to that million of dollars mentioned. So he doesn't want to do anything with academia. You want to go and get the money because he has seen family suffer. Some people who go there is mostly people who are trained by their mothers. They say, the first thing I want to do is to take care of my mom. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then, Going to school will not give him the answer. At least in his mind, what to give him the answer. Correct. And, and another thing is that a lot of the kids, 90% of the time we ask these questions, what do you want to be when you grow up? They don't say scientist, they say basketball, football player. <laughs> That's all they say. So we give them another circumstance. They think if you play sports and you get hurt, what are you going to do afterward? You need a secondary plan. They, have, they like, I don't know. And the sad part about it is, a lot of kids who talk talking about sports all the time, the, the college is making money off them, but in the past, they couldn't make no money. They couldn't, they couldn't work. If they work, then they got hit with, they, they got hit from the NCAA with certain sanctions. So now they have this IRS deal where kids can get endorsements from Nike and other organizations, even in high school. So now they can bring money into the family because they're promoting different products. But still, they need to get that or get a trade. Degrees are not for everybody. You can go into science school without getting a degree. You can go into the medical field, medical technician, sonogram, x-ray technician, things of that nature. Kids can still go into a science field, science technical science field, but still succeed. But a lot of times, kids are programmed for sport. That's in the black community. Would, would they become these professional basketball players or football players or whatever? 
no matter what color they are, if they come from a poor background, they have absolutely no concept of money management either. And nobody teaches them that because if they have a concept of money management, then they're not going to be easily ripped off. They eventually end up spending all their money or having a manager that takes all their money. And <laughs> when they're right in the middle of when anybody else would be excelling in a career in their 30s, early 40s, that's when their professional career as far as sports is pretty much done. So, so what then? Because now they've lost all their money or they've spent all their money and they're right back where they started, but without an education and without the possibility to make an income any longer. Like, I think now in the NFL, if I'm not mistaken, when rookies come in, they are, they are, I think they mandate they take a class on management, on money management. And also how to present yourself in public. Because once you, you're a single male, you're going out in public, you're a sports figure, everybody's coming for you. So you have to know how to pick and choose what you deal with. Some people you have to reject. Everybody's not going to be your friend. Everybody's going to be digging in your pocket. So you got to know how to realize how to pick up that and move away from them, bring people into your phone who are going to be positive towards you because you, you need a positive, you need like a positive tribe. If you don't have a tribe to help you, you have a tribe to bring you down. And that's what you don't want. See, and that's the ironic thing is, and I see it in everyday life and being in yachting, I see a lot of racism in yachting. But the minute that you see a black yacht owner or an Asian yacht owner, everyone is kissing their behinds like nobody's business. So it's almost as if racism depends on the amount of money you have and are worth. Which I think is absolutely ridiculous. It just outlines just how hypocritical people really, truly are. Yeah, I want to go back to your question because I think it's a very important one. But before I go to that, I'm going to address, address the last comment you made. The danger of racism are two forms. On one hand, you have people who are overtly racist. Those people, you don't need to ask of what they can do to you. But the most apoplexing one is people who hide and covertly do so much harm. And people that are educated are very good at it. They are the ones that perpetuate covert one. My friend, Larry Vu, the guy I told you, the white man, right? he says he's characterized, characterized it. But let me put it this way. I can't remember how he phrases it. He's the most pernicious one because you don't know how to deal with that. You may trust the person, and then the person will hurt you the most. Now, I want to go back to your first question because it's very important for what we are trying to do here. And your question was, how can we help? What you are doing right now is fundamental. I see you as I see my mentor, Larry Vold. Larry Vold happened to be a white man, a man whose heart is like gold, a man who will go to the system and say, look, what you are doing is wrong. Can't you do better? He shames them. There was a time in my former school where they bring people from Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, that can't read at fourth grade level. They bring them to college. At the end of the two semesters, these people cannot get 1.5. Why ask them to keep two points to be in college? And the educational system a crunch number. That's why I, whenever you hear me talk about my beef with quant quantitative research, that's the heart of it. Because people have learned how to manipulate data to give them what they want. And they use that to support what they know is not true. Now, coming to what we can do, I can tell you 
for somebody who had experience. In order to solve this problem, it requires all of us. More importantly, people who are white should be able to communicate the evil that had been happening. It may not be happening as we speak, but there are people who had been conditioned and they've developed a mindset. That's the way it goes. And you cannot divorce that mindset from how they behave. That perception is their, real, their reality. And that's what they're going to act on. So what I can say is, like when you get to community where there are just white people and you listen, you got to see some people who make some color statements. Stop them. You're going to have friends who may tend to listen to you more to understand something that a black person may tell them they wouldn't understand it. So those will cumulatively help to, to solve our societal problem. It didn't begin one day, but it has to be tackled. All of us, at least all good thinking human beings. If somebody wants to contact you, Maurice, are they able to reach you through LinkedIn or through email or if they're interested in what you're doing or they want to help in any way? Is there a way that they yeah. can get in contact with you? They can contact me by emailing me. I'm sure to put that link below this interview when it airs so that okay. it's right there yeah. and easy for people to access. Before we let you go, is there anything that you think uh, the audience and ourselves should hear? Basically, support minorities in STEM. Where the kids can go um, get their degrees, get their BS, MS, and PhD, and contribute to society, especially in biomedical research. We need more bi uh, minorities in biomedical research because a lot of times the research is being done, it's not being done on minorities. A lot of times the, the concept and things of clinical trials, uh, vaccines, is not catered towards us. Different things don't work for us as we do other people. So the main thing now is to promote minorities going into the clinical trials, going into the science, and then they can help solve the problems closer to us because they understand what's going on. Guaranteed, guaranteed. Thank you again for your time. It has been Maurice Edward. He is the president of a black scientist. Is that worldwide or U.S.? It's just U.S. And of course, we encourage you definitely to to. Look into it to do whatever you can to support the mission and make it happen. It's simple. It's so simple. Give up your time, give up your money, and give up your support. It's that easy. And yes. of course, I have to say to my co-host, Dr. Joseph Noweye, it's getting better, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I'm Morris. Thank you so much. Keep doing what you are doing. Keep doing what you are doing. This courage. I sure will. My goal is to, right now, our organization is, our members are a little older. I'm trying to bring younger members into the organization. Then what I want to do is try to bring them to a, a university campus and do chapters. If we, do, we can do chapters at both the university campus. We can make our mission and organizations expand. Gentlemen, thank you ever so much. And to the audience out there, thank you ever so much for tuning in. We do appreciate it. You've been watching another episode of Diversity. We hope you'll join us again next week. <laughs>